Hi everyone, I'm Philipp. Um, I'm from Austria, Vienna. That's why I'm sticking to English so you don't have to deal with my Austrian accent. Um, but otherwise, if you have any questions in chat, if you ask in German, that's fine as well. Um, I will try to keep an eye on everything. Um, ask in English, ask in German, I'll try to respond to whatever is going on. So let's dive into SecComp, um, the next layer, or maybe an additional layer of security for your applications. So security is oftentimes this approach where we say everything is fine and maybe we know in the back of our head that not everything is perfectly fine, but we'll just assume that everything is fine um, until something happens. And something might be some bad exploit or somebody starts mining Bitcoin on your AWS instances or whatever bad happens. And at that point, you then realize that, well, Nothing is fine anymore. Everything is on fire and terrible. And we don't want to get to this terrible point. So we want to figure out how we can avoid getting to this bad place, basically. So obviously, there are no silver, silver bullets. Unless somebody is trying to sell you something, then they probably have some silver bullets. But there is this saying that you should be like a werewolf. Um, you should be very afraid of those. So. Don't let anybody tell you that there is a single solution to fix all of your problems, but there are many different things you can do to improve your situation. And that improvement is what I want to cover today. So the main principle that we follow here, and hopefully we follow all in many other places, are is the principle of the least privileges. So why have some privileges if you don't really need those? And SecComp is very much playing into that area or that thing. So SecComp in general is preventing the execution of certain system calls by an application. So let's assume you have a remote code execution vulnerability in your code, but you're using SecComp and you're not allowing certain actions. So even if somebody can exploit your application, if your application cannot do certain things like fork another process, or maybe your system never needs to do a network call, then if you have dropped those permissions or privileges, then even if somebody can break into your application, they still cannot do these things because your application can just never reach those. So it's just one more layer to protect against things that you never need to have or do. And it can either abort the system call or it can kill the entire process. So if somebody breaks into your application and tries to exploit something, it might just kill the process. And then you might see that something is wrong and can react to that. Um, so SecComp in general is like an application sandbox. It's really on the application layer. So the application registers its SecComp profile to then limit or drop the privileges that it doesn't need, basically. And this is really the gist or the idea of it. It was initially added in the Linux kernel in a very, very old version in like, well, 15 years ago or so. Um, but it was only the first step of what we had back then. So you could in the process, the process at the um, SecComp, you could set that one and put an application into strict mode. And strict mode is really strict as the name implies. So it would only allow read, write, exit, or seek return commands. So you cannot open a network connection. You couldn't even dynamically allocate memory with malloc, for example, because all of those uh, system calls would not be allowed, which makes this very secure but pretty much useless for most real world applications. Or you couldn't even open a new file if the file handle wasn't already accessible um, yet um, to read or write to a file. So all of that didn't make it very popular because, well, it was very tightly confined, but probably too tightly confined for a real world application. It was more like, OK, this is possible and we need to evolve this further, which then happened in 2012 when it was properly added for system call control in the kernel. And then a little later on, uh, it actually got the name SecCom for easier configuration of the SecCom profiles. So this is kind of the history how we got to where we are today. So if you want to see the system calls that you have in your system, and I assume everybody has seen those just for the sake of calling. Uh, completeness. So in man calls, um, and I will need to scroll a bit further down here, you have all these different system calls. So whatever you can do here, or which you might require, all of these could be allowed or dropped. So just to get the idea that there are a lot of them by now, 
They're, by the way, also platform dependent. So you might need to do a platform check because the system call uh, number might be different on different platforms. Um, and this is what you can then allow or drop as you go along. And then you can use SecCom as the easy interface to actually interact with those system calls and allow or deny them. So if you run um, and SecCom, this shows you the right headers, how to interact with the SecCom profile. And then you can either set the strict mode um, or you can actually set the filter mode, which uses Berkeley packet filter BPF. Are you already using BPF or where might you already be using BPF? Because probably, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. Um, probably you are using BPF already somewhere to filter something. Probably when you use TCP dump um, to well see what is happening on your network. Yes, those are normally the desperate days when you need to reach for TCP dump. But this is also where you write in BPF to actually find the relevant traffic. So this is how you can use SecCom. Um, and you just need to register that BPF filter, the strict mode, like I said, is probably overly strict for a real world application. So you will write in BPF what is allowed and what is not allowed in your application. And just to show you like what the minimal setup would be, um, you need to include the right headers. And then that BPF proc, that contains the, the filters to your system calls that will be allowed or denied then. And then what we are doing here is first, I'm validating the architecture. So I'm, because if you have like a 32 or 64 bit architecture, those might be different. And we don't want to emulate uh, one or the other. We, we want to make sure that we check for the right architecture. Then we check the system calls. And then we have a list of system calls that we will allow and everything else will be denied. So only what is on the allow list will pass through and everything else will be removed. The approach with the allow list probably makes more sense because new system calls are being added over time. So you don't want to be caught off guard by having new capabilities that you accidentally then allow. Rather, you would want to whitelist or allow list what you want to have in your system. And everything that you don't know, um, you also stop to be on the safe side, which of course will need much more maintenance. Um, but that is the trade-off here. The kind of like simpler approach would be just to, to disallow some calls that you know that you don't need. But of course, um, it is never as complete in terms of protection as with the allow approach. Um, what you need to keep in mind is when you register the profile, every system call of that application actually gets checked against that seccom filter then, which sounds very expensive, but it's not that expensive because all of that is running in kernel space. So you don't have to reach over to user space um, to, for every call, but all of that is being just done in kernel space. And maybe I should have mentioned that earlier. Obviously, I'm only talking about Linux here. Mac has a kind of similar concept that from what I've heard is a bit buggy and not as widely used. Um, Windows has something remotely similar, though I haven't touched Windows in many years. Um, so I, I cannot tell you too much about that. So we will be focusing on Linux and the Linux kernel here. And there the seccom filter is running in kernel space. Um, and the filter results that you can get are um, a call can be allowed, the process or the thread can be killed, or an error is returned to the caller and it is being logged. And we will see later on the being logged of how you can actually see seccom violations um, in your applications or on your hosts. So is anybody using seccom already? And actually quite a lot of applications do. Um, this is not a complete list, but probably you're using those on a pretty daily basis. So from Chrome to Firefox, OpenSSH, Docker, which we'll look a bit into, systemd, Firecracker, many other systems use seccom filters for actual or additional security. On the other hand, unfortunately, many other programs don't, but those who are more security aware, many of those are already shipping seccom profiles with their application because it's always the application sandbox driven by the application itself. 
So how you could add your application to that list is you would need to ship a SecComp profile filter with your application. And I'll show you some examples how you could do that then, for example, from your own Java application or from a Go application. So Docker, since I assume many of you are using Docker, um, it's trying to have like some same defaults for what makes sense security wise, what is allowed and what is not allowed. Um, and it does disable around 44 system calls um, out of the 300 plus that are available. And you can actually find that here in the default JSON, you will find uh, what is allowed. And if I'm not mistaken, they also use an allow list where they have all the system calls that they do allow um, are listed in that JSON file. Um, some of the system calls that Docker is blocking is clock set time, for example, because um, the time of your computer is not namespaced. So if the container would try to change it, it would change the time on the host as well, which you probably don't want. Um, you cannot um, clone a namespace. You cannot reboot the host. Um, you cannot um, share or change a namespace. All of those are things that you normally don't need or don't want to have. And that's why they are forbidden with system calls or seccomp filters. Um, <laughs> You can run Docker without the default SecCom profile, but this is definitely not recommended. Like do that at your own risk. Um, but for example, um, if you pass the parameter uh, security opt SecCom unconfined, it would skip all the default SecCom filters. And then for example, you could just run something as root directly here. Whereas um, with the default SecCom profile filters, um, running the who am I on the map user route um, would fail because you would not have the, the capability to, to unshare this command. So this is where seccomp is coming into play here. By the way, if you're using that capability add, for example, if you add whatever capability for networking, for example, or so um, to your Docker container, that adds both the capability and what is not really explicit in the name, it also allows the right system call if it would be blocked otherwise. So you don't need to manually change anything with the system calls, but that capability add will take care of that for you transparently as well. Just when you might be confused why some calls are allowed or not allowed, um, that capability add takes care of the seccomp filter for you as well. Yes, um, I see FireJail mentioned in the chat. We'll get to FireJail. Um, a little later, FireJail is very handy to actually try out uh, seccomp filters. Um, and it's, yeah, this is like the hello world of seccomp filters and FireJail is definitely the right tool um, for that in there. Um, is any of your applications using uh, seccomp filters already? To figure that out, um, what you want to do is, um, let me change to my console again. We want to grab for seccomp in all the processes that we have running. And then you can see zero means, well, it's not using seccomp. One would be the strict mode and two is it's using the BPF filter for a seccomp profile. So for example, we could just take a look, I don't know. Let's like, take a look at this process here, had proc status. Um, okay, this seems to be a system B that is using um, seccomp or let's take a look at something else. It's always a surprise for me as well, which process we're getting here. Uh, okay, this is another system D login. Uh, let's see, maybe we are luckier here to see something other than system B, but that's also a starting point to see that this is using seccomp filters. Okay, heartbeat. Heartbeat is the elastic heartbeat, which is basically like a pinger to check if the system is up or down. For example, I work for Elastic. I'll get into that in a moment. Our products all use SecComp. That's also why I'm talking about that, because we have invested quite some time to make SecComp available on most of our products. And well, the beats that we have, those all use SecComp filters, like Heartbeat or the other beats. Okay, so this is what we've just seen. This would be one example for, okay, I, I had system D network here as well. So you have all the examples in the slides, um, but you can just check on your system what is actually using seccomp filters and what isn't. 
Okay, so why am I talking about all of that? As I mentioned, I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, Beats. I'm officially a developer advocate, so I mostly talk about the good stuff that we do, or I try to understand how stuff works and why it breaks, so I can help out others um, to see why their systems might not be behaving the way they do. Um, this is what we normally do, and most people probably know that. Um, does anybody know which of our products use SecComp profiles and which don't? So Elasticsearch does. Um, Logstash and Kibana so far don't. I think Kibana has an open issue for SecComp uh, profiles with Node, which seems to be slightly trickier. Um, Logstash is JRuby and is not using that. And we add another component uh, more recently, or it's been a couple of years by now as well, called Beats um, for like lightweight agents or shippers, um, which also have the reason that since we have now a B in Elk and there is no B in Elk so far, we tried to come up with something new and it looks something like this. So you can see at first it was an Elk and then it developed into this, um, which we call the Elk, a uh, Belk or Elk B. Um, as you can see, it has horns and is a B. And Beats is also using SecComp profiles, which basically leaves us in our stack here. We have Elasticsearch that stores the data. So this is secured by SecComp profiles. And beats, which are the agents that you roll out on many of or all of your hosts to collect logs or get metrics or check if systems are up or collect security events, those are also protected by SecComp, which kind of makes sense. The thing that keeps your data should be well protected and the agents that you roll out across your hosts also are well protected. Kibana and Logstash are still on the to-do list to add SecComp profiles. So, how are you doing that with SecCom profiles in a Java process? Because Elasticsearch is a Java process. So what you're using in Java is JNA, the Java native access. And with that Java native access, you can actually influence or change what is being allowed down to the SecCom profiles. And I've linked the right piece in the current release in the source code here. So I'll show you some pieces of source code, but I've also always linked to the right pieces. So if you have a Java application and want to do something similar, this is where you can just copy the code from. So I hope that is not too small for you to see. Um, might be slightly small, not sure. I'll try to explain what is going on here. So the first thing that we are doing here is we have a check um, running as root. This is not seccom specific. I'm just mentioning this here because it's another kind of like brick or layer in that wall of protection is if you try to run Elasticsearch as root on Linux, because Windows doesn't have the same concept, then the process will throw a runtime exception and system exit because you should not run any server processes as root and the process will just fail. This is not seccom, but this is just another layer here. And after that, if we are not running as root, then we actually install the system called filters. And those um, then look like this. And if this is too small, um, this just shows that if you're on Linux, um, then you are calling the Linux SecCom profile implementation. If we're on a Mac, um, we're calling that one. Um, we have a check for SunOS and FreeBSD, even though they are not officially supported anymore. And we also have some check for that on Windows. And if the operating system is anything else that we don't support, it would also pay immediately. And then, yeah, like I said, on other operating systems, like on Mac or on Windows, there are similar concepts, but I would just focus on SecComp profiles here. Um, so we'll skip over the other operating systems. So here on, on Linux, um, we check um, the architecture. And then, for example, we limit that. You cannot fork the process. So even if we had a remote code execution in Elasticsearch, which I hope we don't, even if you could run arbitrary code, you could not fork out another process, or you could not execute another binary, because we never do that. So we drop the capabilities for that. Since we never need those permissions, we'll just not allow the process um, and drop those. Heading over to beats, which are written in Go, we have written our own SecComp BPF DSL or nicer syntax in Go. 
um, which is an open source project which you can use in your own Go binaries. Uh, what that looks like here, you can define your rules in YAML. If that is a good or bad idea, um, depends a bit on your taste around YAML. Some people will say this is the only right way to do stuff. Probably those who use a lot of Kubernetes. Um, many others will say like, well, if I could have it in code, I would rather do it in code. The library that we have built here is doing it in YAML. So it is what it is. You can set a default action, which here is allow. So by default, it will allow, allow everything. By the way, this is not; these are not the actual rules that we have in Beats. Because in Beats, um, the default action would be denied. So there we also need to add the capabilities that we actually need, because it's the more secure approach. This is just an example of how you could use that library. But this is not what the Beats do. Um, and here. What we allow um, is, um, oh, sorry, no, what we drop here is these permissions. So connect, accept, send to, um, all of those are dropped, which again, for Beats, it's, it's a shipper over the network, doesn't make much sense. Is it, if it cannot connect to anything, um, then it's probably not going to be a very useful shipper. But this is just an example. Um, for the actual rules, um, you can see those in this piece of code here. And you can see this as platform specific. So on Linux, on the 64-bit uh, platform, um, we have a very long list of what is allowed. So what is allowed is accept and access and bind, etc. So lots of things that are allowed here. Generally, like I've said two times, I think already, allow over deny. So since new system calls might be added over time, uh, you don't want to be caught off guard by the new Linux version that allows something that you don't want to have in your application. So if you only allow what you explicitly need, you will never be in or have that problem. So um, we'll get to fire jail in a moment and how to do that. So just to give you a bit of an idea of how um, or what we could do here. So I'm, again, this is like the, the hello world application of everything. I'm using Netcat, I'm listening on port 1025 and I can chat with, with myself. Um, so I'm just using Telnet. This is a live instance. If you're quick, you might be able to send me a message as well. Um, please behave. Uh, so if I say hello, then I'm receiving the hello that I have sent here. And yeah, you can see um, I am here using the Austrian Telecom. And this is from where this message has originated. I will use Netcat, not because Netcat is, is a great application that anybody would be using in production, but because Netcat is very nice to see, like we will focus on the bind here, um, that Netcat is binding to this port and then able to receive something. And we want to dive into different things that we can deny here and how, how you could even figure out what permissions uh, or what capabilities it's need, it is needing. So we have started the chat. If you run strace, you could then check the, the bind that it's using and then just run the general uh, binary again. So if I run the, just one more time here, Ah, am I in the right process? Here we go. Um, so I'm only interested in the bind because otherwise you would see a lot of system calls happening here. Um, and okay, somebody tried to just connect, um, which is not me anymore. Um, so here, this was the bind command that we have tried. Um, and you can see we have had the bind. So if we take away the bind, this system would not run afterwards. And um, one other thing that is, by the way, um, pretty um, interesting is if you run strace with the dash c command and let it run, and then, for example, interact with it, it will at the end show you a collection of all the system calls it has been using. Because then, once you try to add your own seccom filter, you will have the question of like which uh, system calls do I even need to allow here? And this might be one of the ways um, to do this here. So once I exit that, it shows me which system calls have been used. And you can see um, how many times they were used, um, if there were any errors or not. 
And then to write the right seccom profile filter, you would just need to parse out this list of calls. Let's assume those are all the valid ones that you want to allow, and you just put all of those on the allow list, and then your application should be able to run. If you have kind of covered the full application spectrum and features, and of course, if you add new features that will need new capabilities, you will need to run this again to complete your list or extend your list of things that should be allowed. Um, you can also do that programmatically, by the way. Um, so if you want to have that programmatically, there are two projects that I've found. Um, one is just some C code that will run a syscall reporter that you can add to your C program and list those out at the end. And then there is another um, Process, uh, program or library um, that will help you figure out which uh, system calls your application has been doing. So you can actually see what you need. Okay, now getting to file jail that somebody already mentioned in chat. Um, it can add seccom VPF sandboxes. So we can take away capabilities from a process. So what we basically want to do is I'm running fire jail. I, I don't have specified any profile. So this you can just run. And I'm dropping the capability to bind. So if I run this, it will obviously fail to actually start the process um, because, well, it didn't have the capability and I just exited the process here. Um, you can throw S trace in the mix again, by the way. So if you run that, it will show you these are all the system calls that have happened. And then you can see, OK, here the bind is being called. And then you have the, the system call or the, the, the binary is caught, uh, killed immediately um, as soon as you try to use that bind which you have forbidden. So this is how you can simulate, like either you create a profit for your binary um, or you just list out the capabilities that you want to add or drop. You can try to run it and then you can figure out is this working or is this too strict or maybe it's still too lenient. And with S trace, you can actually see these are all the system calls that happened before and what is happening right around when the application is then exiting, for example. So this is just a nice overview to, to see what is going on here. Okay. One question that comes up sometimes is how do you stop permission changes? Because let's assume you have a binary, you have a remote code execution. Somebody runs whatever code you want inside your application. You have dropped some capability. Could they not just use the remote code execution to re-add the capability? So basically extend the privileges of the application again, which would totally circumvent the, the point of second filters, right? So what would be the solution? There are probably multiple solutions to that, or there are possible solutions how, how SecCom could be doing that. Either can you never change SecCom profiles after you have set them up initially? Um, could you limit the changes to SecCom profile filters? Or more the YOLO approach, don't care if somebody is smart enough to do that, um, it's tough luck. No, it's actually the, the second one. So you can set, and you should set that, the no new privileges, basically that means when you when you set this, any privilege that you have dropped, you cannot take back again. So once you have disabled bind, even if you have a remote code execution, your binary could not add the capability to bind anymore because we have taken this no new privileges. You could further tighten down the rules afterwards. So at runtime, you could always add more kind of or disallow more system calls over time but you could not re-add what the ones that you have already removed. Um, we're doing that in Elasticsearch as well. So that's a bit better hidden in the system call filter, um, but there um, the system call set no new privileges is number 38, um, which has been around since Linux 3.5. And we actually set that at the very beginning. So generally you set that at the beginning that whatever you drop after this point, you can never take back again. Same goes for beats, um, where you we just have, since it has like this nice structure and it wraps everything behind the scenes, um, you just set no new briefs to true, and then you can never retake the privileges that you don't need anymore. So we can limit down all the things and hopefully protect against that. Which leaves us with one thing. Um, how do we figure out what has gone wrong. 
like if we have any seccomp violations in our applications. And for that, we can use another tool in the Linux tool chain, uh, which is AuditD, the Linux auditing daemon, um, which can also react to certain activities um, that your applications are doing. And for that, we have wrapped that in one of the beats, which is called audit beat, which audit D, audit beat kind of makes sense. We basically wrap the output of audit D because the format of that is a pain in the ass to parse. Um, we've wrapped that in a beat so that can ship it directly to Elasticsearch. Um, that is, by the way, wrapped again in a Go um, binary. So we have Go lib audit, which wraps audit D, so we can use it in audit beat. Um, again, this is an open source library that you could then use in uh, your own applications. And what this looks like, um, let me try to find my browser. Come on, browser. Um, oh, sorry, my browser is on the other window. Um, what we have here, um, let me quickly refresh. Um, so here I have audit beat running and it's collecting all kinds of things on my system uh, that might be security violations. So you can see in the last 30 minutes, we had a couple of thousand hits of things um, that were possible um, or were happening. What I want to do now is I have this event action violated seccomp policy. Um, and let's filter down to that event action. Violated seccomp policy, that sounds good. Um, and you can see in the last 30 minutes, those were my two fire jail calls where we had two seccomp violations. Let me add one to show you what we have actually collected here. So you can see audit beat has collected the data. You can also see um, where this is running. So um, yeah, this is my instance uh, on AWS where this is running. You can see um, the message type is it's coming from seccomp. You can see which binary we were using. So it was netcat that we tried to run. Um, you can see uh, which was the primary actor. So the Ubuntu user is the user that I was using that one here. I've enriched those events with some additional information. So for example, you can see that this is running on my cloud provider, um, which is AWS. Um, and you can see, um, Details about the host, like the operating system. Maybe this is operating system specific that you had some security issue. You can see the process name um, and well, the user name and user ID. So with this information, you could figure out that okay, there was a second profile violation. Which binary was affected? From which user has this been started? Um, maybe which instance on Amazon this is using, or which IP address is affected, or which base image is affected? And then you could figure out like, is this a real problem or don't I care that much about it? Um, by the way, we have also a bit of a nice interview for that, uh, which is called SIEM, um, the security information and event management, where you can see I have here all my hosts, which is a single host and you, we have logins and whatever. Um, what I'm interested in now is events, which will probably have quite a few events in here. And with all the screen sharing, my CPU is struggling a bit, but you can see here, um, you can see what is happening on that host. Since it, this is all based on Elasticsearch, which is pretty good with search, um, I'm just searching for seccom because that's what I'm interested in. And now it's showing me violated seccom policy. So this is just a full text search over everything. And now I could say, for example, oh, I'm interested just in that binary or just in that host or just in that user. Um, let's say I'm interested in that user. So I'm taking that user, dragging and dropping it here. And then I could just see in that timeline, what has that specific user been up to? And then you can see, okay, here with S-Trace, um, program crashed, program crashed. Here we have um, seccom process violation. So this user is up to something weird. Or you can see here, I was executing Netcat. This was when it was actually successful when I just was opening port 1025 and we could check with it. Um, so that one was actually successful. Whereas the other ones were not so successful on the frequency crashed or um, seccomp violation. So this way you could see this is what the user is up to and then we could, I don't know, 
isolate the user or take down the host that is affected or whatever. Um, so this is just building on top or around what SecCom profiles can already provide to you. Um, we've seen that. Um, so to wrap up, I'm always comparing this a bit to a uh, one of the many bricks in the wall of your security uh, setup. And SecComp is one very handy tool. So if your application doesn't need specific permissions, why give it to the application in the first place? Just drop them and you're good to go. And you don't need to worry that somebody will execute a binary or fork a process because you know that you will never do that. Um, one question that I see that comes up every now and then is SecComp versus SA Linux or App Armor. Both of them are similar that they are doing kernel level filtering or inception of system calls. Where they're different is that SecComp is actively set by the process itself, whereas SA Linux or AppArmor are mandated by, well, the system on the whole system level um, and is run before the process runs. Whereas for SecComp, the binary sets or brings its own rules um, and enforces them which is nice if the application author provides those. But if they don't, then it's kind of like problematic because you would need to add them yourself. Um, SecComp is pretty widely available. So your browser, Docker, Firecracker, FireJail, lots of other systems can use it. And it should be used more widely, I think. Um, so if you can and have some application that has some security sensitivity, it might be an interesting project to add SecCom profiles to your application so that those can then be installed when you run your binary. Um, if you want to have a platform independent way to interface with the Linux kernel system calls, um, there is lib seccom that might, made write, might make writing those rules um, a bit easier for you, which is, I think, the final tip I have in my slides to work with seccom. Um, oh yeah, Windows. Um, that's quite a mouthful. So process mitigation system called disable policy is, I think, the thing that is pretty close to um, SecComp on Windows um, because it also has restrictions on what system calls a process can invoke. But it seems to behave quite differently than what you have in SecComp and Linux. Um, but like I said, I haven't touched Windows in a couple of years, so I haven't tried that one out. and I. I, try, I will try to avoid it if I can help it. Um, and with that, are there any questions? Let me try to find my chat again. Um, can you share that notes in the share tab? Um, which uh, tabs? Wait. Um, the one thing that I wanted to drop, just in case, um, once them are the slides. I find them. Give me one second. This is it. So, if anybody wants to have the slides, these are the slides. Um, any other questions? Sure, cool. Um, the, the Jedi mind trick seems to be working today. Um, any other questions? We should have plenty of time, though I don't think anybody wants to hear me ramble for 55 minutes. So I think 40 was good. Um, any other questions? Seccom, Elastic Related, um, Audit D, whatever you want. If not, I wish everybody uh, any good for interaction. Uh, sec, uh, seccom. Um, I haven't stumbled over any any GUIs for for seccom to be honest. Um, but since BPF and everything seems pretty low level, maybe this is your chance to write a, a nice project on on GitHub or wherever. Um, I haven't stumbled over anything. But to be honest, I have never looked for a GUI explicitly for seccom. Uh, writing second profiles. 
Um, the question, does the app-centric approach still force you to trust the application? Yes. I mean, of course it does. But I, but I mean, if you run somebody's binary, I guess you trust that the binary is doing the right thing. So seccomp is not going to, to save you from anything. Seccomp is, is just like if they have a security issue in their application, that they can add a layer of protection against that. It will not protect you against malicious binaries. So yeah, I mean, you can compile it yourself and add your own seccomp profile. Um, as another layer of protection, but generally the second profiles I would see as a, a security feature that somebody who writes an application and is security sensitive um, adds as a benefit. It doesn't protect you against bad binaries. Does it make sense to use for web apps? Um, hmm. I mean, web, web app is sounds like it it depends a bit like what you define as web app like so Elasticsearch is also like has an HTTP interface and just you send it JSON and send to JSON back and you still want to protect it uh, by um, SecCom. It's probably getting a lot trickier if you have a general purpose programming language and run that in an application server where you register those. Um, but maybe so for example, what you might want to add are other features. So for example, what we have in in Elasticsearch, we have and we like there are multiple checks of security things that we do. So seccomp is one. So you cannot fork the process or you cannot call another binary because we don't do that. Um, then we check that you're run, not running as root. And for example, we're also using the Java security manager. And with the Java security manager, that's like Java's security concept, there you could limit that you can only read files from a specific directory, for example, from this package. So you could, with the Java security manager, you could say like only this one package here is allowed to access these configuration files because no other part of my application needs to read or write anything. Or for example, only the thing, or there is like a package that writes to the disk out, only this one package can write to the disk. So if you have a a bug or problem in another package, it would not be allowed to actually write to your data directory. But that's another layer here. I don't think seccomp is like, vanilla seccomp will not be the solution for, for a generic web application, but it's one of the many pieces that you want to have in there. For example, I'm, I would need to check if, for example, Nginx uses seccomp. Um, maybe somebody has it running and can quickly check that the command was a bit earlier. Um, to, to see if, for example, Nginx could fork out another process or if that doesn't care, because that's, I think, where second will come into play. Yeah, to be honest, I have not compared it to Sandbox Init and Pledge. I'm, I'm not really sure. If anybody has any experiences with those, I, I would also be curious. Um, I'm not... I once had a discussion that somebody said like uh, macOS has a similar concept as seccom, but it was less mature from what I know. I'm not sure if that is sandbox in it or if that is also called seccom on Mac. I have been very Linux focused here, to be honest. Any final questions? Or is everybody happy to head over to their Sunday afternoon, the next talk, a break? Cool. Well, if you have any other questions, um, this is Twitter. Um, so just ping me if you have anything. Um, thanks a lot for joining on a Sunday, which is, yeah, a, a tough day especially Sunday afternoon. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having me. And let me know if you have anything else on Twitter. Thanks, everyone. Bye.